the countryside south of Spokane along the Palouse Highway and gather some fire starting materials um, to show you what you need to collect to start your fires. It's pretty out here with the fields in bloom. The weather's kind of mixed today, but the clouds are pretty spectacular. I'm glad the rain let up, getting a little sunbreak here. We're going to head out along this railroad grade and go out into the woods and see what we can find. Hi hey guys, it's Foley again. Um, walking through the woods here, I thought I would get out in the woods and uh, show you how to collect some fire materials to make your fires. It's been raining really heavily here for the last two days and only this morning has the weather started to clear up and we're getting some sun now. So these conditions, while not terrible for starting a fire, uh, definitely necessitate being smart about collecting your materials. We're looking for dry wood, dry standing wood that's up off the ground and protected in the tree line. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, likely we're gonna see some interesting stuff out here in the woods and maybe we'll just do a little bit of nature hike as we go on. All right. Everything's pretty wet, so I wanted to get out in the woods a little bit and show you what um, what you would be looking for if you were trying to start a fire in these types of conditions. We're going to do a little tracking here just because there's a lot of interesting stories to tell here in the woods that I'm seeing right now and I thought you guys might appreciate that. So a lot of bushcraft and outdoor living and survival skills. This was all second nature to the First Nations people and Native Americans as well as pioneers and mountain men of the earlier times. And uh, this was survival for them, it meant the difference between life and death. But for us, uh, a lot of these skills are a lost art, but there's more and more people learning about them and it's pretty exciting because I think in our everyday lives in an urban environment we forget about our connection to nature and that's certainly important now more than ever. Anyhow, uh, it may be hard for you guys to see this but I'm actually on a deer superhighway and so you can see there's a disturbance here in the ground that the deer, oh, look, there's a shotgun shell, uh, the deer cross through this area quite frequently. So uh, you can see here as the trail crosses here, you can see there's bark all along this piece of wood except for right here. This is right down the middle of the trail, and the deer, zoom back a little bit, the deer run across this and they clip their hooves on the bark here. And you can see that they've knocked, knocked all the bark off of that. The trail continues on here. We're gonna 
cut it here and go a little bit farther and see if we can see a couple of other interesting signs that I can highlight for you um, since we're out here. This stuff looks hard to see on the video, so we'll have to do the best we can. But we'll do a little tracking uh, activity here while we're out in the woods looking for fire starting materials. I'm continuing to walk along this deer trail and we were going to talk about fires today and we still will but there's just so much interesting things going on here that uh, I'd like to show you some of this. This is a really pretty plant. It's called rattlesnake plantain. Um, and if I come along over here wanted to show you I'm still on this deer superhighway you can see the disturbed ground here where the greenery is just worn away this is probably a more distinct part of the trail for you um, it can be a little hard to see on the video but you can see there's brush all here and then right down the center here right through here that's all worn away going off into the brush there this is what a animal superhighway looks like. You can see they've disturbed the ground here. There's just a lot of deer traveling on this route, and uh, they keep walking. We're still on that deer trail. If you look here, you can see here's some scat right in here. This is some old, old deer scat. And so again, you can often tell what type of animals are traveling along the trail by hair, by scat, by tracks. All of these are clues as to the ecosystem and what animals are in the landscape and what they're doing. When you learn how to read more, you can understand what the animals are doing by some of the signs they leave behind. So I was saying, sometimes you can tell what's going on by some of the signs that are left. So hair, scat, tracks. So not only are the deer running along this trail, but so are the coyotes. And this is some coyote scat here, and you can see there's a lot of hair in here, possibly deer. There's some chunks of bone right there. And right there, you can see there's some cancellous bone right there. So this is coyote scat along the deer superhighway. So there's coyotes here and there's deer here and the coyotes are hunting the deer. And that's a pretty big coyote actually. And that's a, uh, you can also get an idea of the size of the animal by the size of their scat. So that's an interesting uh, sign there. Still moving along that deer trail and as you can see that deer trail, it's uh, crossing a barbed wire fence here. The deer have to go between these two and I want to point this out to you here. This can happen under sticks as well, but there's a barb right here on the barbed wire fence and you can see, just giving you a little contrast there, that as the deer have gone under this fence, that barb has caught a lot of deer fur here or so. It's another sign that deer are traveling along this this route through the woods and have to cross under this barbed wire and as they do it scrapes along their backs and drags off some of their hair. So that's another interesting little tracking sign there I thought I would share with you. As we're roaming around the woods looking for 
our materials to gather up to make our fire. And we want to be very discerning as to what materials we're going to collect because, as I said, it's been raining a lot here and everything's pretty damp. Um, we want to be very picky, especially at the beginning of starting your fire, that you're getting the right materials. Um, but as I was going along the deer trail here and looking around, I saw another sign here. So what you see here are ponderosa pine pine cones. And you can see all of these have been pulled out to get all the pine nuts. I don't know these are not pine nuts, like commercial pine nuts, but they do have a nut. These are seeds. And you can see, here's what it looks like normally. And probably a squirrel has stripped this off during the winter and had a little squirrel feast right here. So you'll see these all over the place in the woods uh, in the spring. Oftentimes they'll this is the only thing that they can get. Squirrels don't hibernate over the winter, and so they'll harvest these. And oftentimes they have a favorite spot where they'll eat them. So you'll sometimes you'll see a big pile of them up on a stump or a rock or um, in a hollow of a tree where they've been, or a hollow area under a tree, uh, where they've just been sheltering and uh, having a little squirrel snack on these seeds here. So as we're bushwhacking along here, I've come across this little stream and you can see in the picture here, there's this log that's falling across the stream. Uh, as we're looking for fire materials, this is a great resource uh, because this is a birch log and birch bark is a great tinder. It has a lot of resin in the bark itself and although this doesn't grow very commonly where I'm at, um, it does grow quite commonly about 50 miles north of where we are in Spokane up towards Canada a little bit. But if you can get this tinder material it's, it's excellent because it has a lot of resin in the bark that will light even when wet so we're going to harvest some of this you can see that that log has rotted away i was able to stick my knife right into the log in fact the hardest part of the whole log that's left is that resinous bark Here's a real nice example of that birch bark. So, slip my knife under that a little bit. Try and peel that off. You see that rich red color on the underside of this. This is, you know, downed, uh, and it's in a very damp area. In fact, it's literally resting across the stream. Um, but this is highly resinous and this should burn if we scrape it upright. So we're definitely taking that. The stream that we found is a huge resource in the area for animals and so the open running water is a water source that they'll take advantage of. So oftentimes there will be deer runs leading down to a resource like this. So if we go along here again, we can see you know, there's some tracks right in here where the deer have been climbing along this hillside to get down to the stream and they have quite a big 
deer run going down to the stream. Again, you can see they've knocked all the bark off that log as it crosses over the main trail. Again, when we're tracking, we're really looking for signs of disturbances in the landscape. And we're on a little bit of a steep slope here going down to that creek that we crossed. And you can see that it's fairly moist in here so the deer are sliding a little bit and their hooves are digging in and leaving more distinct tracks. But you can see that there's just a ton of deer running up and down this whole major deer highway down to the creek to get at that water. So sometimes when you're tracking, pay attention to the terrain, pay attention to what resources the animals are going to be looking for. Um, this can help guide you where you might want to go to see more animal tracks as well. So you always want to be observant, both of terrain, resources in the landscape, what might the animals need, what they might they be looking to eat or to drink, and where can they find that, or where can they find shelter, or any of the other things that they need. And that can guide you where to look for uh, different kinds of animals and where to look for different kinds of signs. So we're in the understory and even though it has been quite wet, all the sticks here on this tree are in a much more sheltered position. And that was a squirrel by the way. You can hear that in the background. In a more sheltered position and this is what we're looking for in wet conditions is what we call dry standing wood. So this is wood that's dead and it's seasoned yet it's still attached to the tree and up off of the ground. So we have a much higher chance of all of these little branches on the underside of the canopy here being dry and less having less moisture content but you want to be careful which ones you select because it might not be seasoned enough so what we're looking for when we try and break this off is a really clear snap that will tell us that this is well seasoned so let's try this one you hear that click that's that crack is what we're looking for to know that we have good dry standing wood. And that one was a little wet. It bent a little bit before I could snap it off, but you can hear that snapping. There, that was a good one. And it just feels different when you break it off the tree. And so when you're looking to start your fire, you're going to look to collect several things. You're going to look for tinder sources, so that birch bark that we mentioned, cattail, other um, plant materials that are very dry and have high surface area. And your second stage will be kindling. And what we're looking for, again, is that dry standing wood. And that that is sheltered back in amongst the forest canopy, especially if it's been raining a lot. So we're going to gather up a whole bunch of these twigs into a big twig bundle and we'll take those back to start our fire. While we're in amongst all these dry standing pine branches, I saw this bit of pitch hanging here. I wanted to mention that. Um, pitch is a uh, the material produced by the tree to seal up wounds and it has really flammable properties and you can harvest this and use this as an accelerant if you're trying to start 
a fire in wet conditions. So this is just a drip that's fallen on this branch from a wound on the tree. This is a big chunk of pitch that is on a ponderosa pine, and you can just take a chunk of the bark off uh, with that pitch on it if it's hardened pitch like this, or you can take a stick and dig into the pitch if it's a little bit softer and, and harvest that pitch. It can be very helpful um, getting a fire going in wet conditions. I showed you the pitch on the tree where uh, the tree had, had a wound on it in a, our previous clip, but another resource that can be really useful for fire starting in very difficult and wet conditions is what is called fatwood. And so pine trees essentially are self pruners. And so the branches that are underneath the canopy and not getting as much light, they're going to get pruned off by the tree essentially and the tree will stop putting resources into those branches if they're not getting enough light. And so in that process, the tree will seal that off with sap within the branches. And so oftentimes these dead standing branches on the pine trees, and I think this tall one, right, right, oh, I can't see my finger right there. Uh, I think this is probably a fairly good candidate if I can use my little folding saw to take one of these limbs off to find some what they call fat wood, which is essentially wood that's impregnated with sap. Um, terpenes is actually the, the chemical. Um, it's what they make turpentine out of. And so just like the birch bark, that resin is highly flammable and um, if you can get a chunk of that wood, even in wet conditions, that wood will take a flame and if you prepare it properly, even a ferro rod and be able to burn even when wet and get wet materials going. Even if your other branches in your fire are wet. So we're gonna look around and see if we can't find some of this fat wood or sap wood in the uh, evergreen trees here. Another source of fat wood can be down trees like this. And oftentimes, the, uh, as the branches enter the wood, the wood will rot away. And again, just like that birch bark, the resins keep the, the wood from rotting. And so while this chunk that I busted out of the dead tree has a little bit of fat wood right in the center, and hold that for you. Right there, you can see that that change from the, the lighter wood here to that really red, red rosy color in the center. Um, there's not a lot of it in this. Um, there's some, and you can see that, you know, it, it made this wood not rot away as fast as the rest of the wood, but it's still not really a good example of if I was going to harvest this and and take this home to start my fire um, you know it's not a great example of that fat wood but that's the principle um, if you look at um, conifer species and look at where branches come into the dead wood Sometimes you can find a tree that really produces a lot. This one and that other tree did not. Again, I cut this one just to see uh, if there was any fat wood in there. And you can see right here, that's an example of what I'm looking for. Uh, much darker, very red, obviously um, impregnated with sap right there. It's a wood that has a uh, that kind of fat content, that kind of terpene content, 
uh, that's going to do very well for us. But this, this branch doesn't have a whole lot of it, so we're going to keep looking. You can tell a fire went through here in the past. A lot of these trees have significant burnt bark on the outside of them. We're actually going to take a little bit of this and see if we can create an ember uh, out of this charred material to show you another technique. So you can see there's a really chunky charred, charred bark here. And that might take a spark from a ferro rod or a spark from a flint and steel and you might be able to blow that into flame. So sometimes pre-charred material um, can serve as the initial thing to take a spark and then you can blow that up into flame if you have good tinder. So we're going to take a little bit of that. You can see there's some pitch mixed in amongst that too that could also help us. So we're just going to cut some of this out and put it in our bag and we'll test it out. All right. So the other type of tinder we're looking for is any of this stringy dried plant material. So up under all the new grass growth is last fall's grass, which is fairly dried um, in this little spot. So we're going to take some of that grass and just stick it in our pocket and dry it out a little bit more. Grass is very hydrophilic and when it's dry it works great as a tinder, but uh, does tend to uh, pick up moisture very quickly. Some of the lichens are also good tinder, but only if they are bone dry. We'll grab some of that lichen and try and dry it out while we're hiking as well and see, see how that works when we get back to the house. All right. I think uh, it's thinking about raining because I can hear some thunder in the background. So I'm going to move off this ridge line we're going to head back down into that ravine before it starts dumping on us. All right, as I've headed down back into the ravine, I'm near that creek again, and the trees have changed. We have a lot more deciduous trees down here in the ravine, and there's a lot of poplar trees in this area, and I can tell a big windstorm has come through here probably earlier in the week when we had all that rain it was quite quite a storm and you can see it's knocked down a big poplar branch right here and then all kind of littered through this area is some of those seed pods from the poplar and this fluffy stuff can also make good tinder if it's dry and you mix it with other tinder sources so the fluff from the poplar seeds can be good tinder and then the other thing I see here is a old dead rotted out poplar stump here not focusing let's try that again there we go uh, and you can see the inner bark that's left there's all these strands of inner bark, the cambium layer. And this, when properly prepared, uh, makes excellent tinder. So we're going to take some of that. You can see it's stripping off in really fine little strands. And that's the kind of material you're looking for if you're going to make a, a tinder bundle. And sometimes you mix that stuff up with the, the fluff. The fluff catches really easily, but it's more of a flash tinder, and it'll go up really fast and 
It'll catch a spark real well, but it won't maintain the flame for very long. But if you mix it with the bark, uh, the barks tend to burn a little bit longer than grasses and some of the real uh, fluffy tinder like cattail fluff or uh, this poplar bark, seed bark, so, sorry, this poplar uh, seed fluff. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed our little jaunt in the woods today and you learned uh, a little bit about what are the things you're looking for in the woods to gather materials for making your fires. We're gonna head back out now, head home, and then we'll show you how to put it all together to start your fires. So, all right. I was heading out along the trail, sorry for the ori weird orientation of the video here, um, but I saw this ponderosa pine along the side that had been knocked down this winter and I saw some big branches on it that looked like they'd been pruned off prior to the tree coming down so I thought I would just climb off the trail and cut a chunk here. If you look at this, um, the center of that, you can see a little bit of that red red center, um, but if I turn it over up close to where the branch enters the tree, you can see that there's a lot more of that red color in there. That, that's more of what we're looking for in terms of that fat wood. So that, that definitely has a lot of terpene content and that looks pretty good. So we're going to go ahead and take that. Um, but again, when you're cutting these off the tree and you're looking for it, cut right next to the tree. And um, that's where you want to look at, uh, at the branch to see if there's that sap wood content in it. All right, I stopped to put my rain jacket on because it's really coming down now. But I thought I'd let you listen to the rain just a smidge because it sounds really nice. And we'll head on out. The being prepared always with rain gear and extra clothes is important because you just never know what the weather's going to throw at you. So if you're out and about, always be prepared and you can still be out and enjoy the weather if you've got proper gear. All right, I was almost back to the car and I saw these two pine stumps cut off by the side of the road and I just wanted to compare and contrast that uh, sapwood content in these. Sometimes you find a tree and doesn't have much like that stump and then right next to it here's another stump literally two feet away and you can see it has a completely different amount of fatwood content in that. Um, that You're looking for that really rich red coloration in there and, and that stump would have an awful lot and if you want to go to the work of breaking that out um, that um, that's really an excellent uh, view of what that looks like and that that would uh, light up even if it was totally wet if you put a flame on it so um, that's what you're looking for ideally okay on the drive back I saw some cattails along the side of the road and that's some of that cattail fluff and that can work as a great inner tinder when you're making a tinder bundle. It's a, it's a flash tinder. It'll go up really quickly, but you can mix that in with grasses or barks and it makes a great uh, center for your bird nest when you're making a, a tinder bundle. So we're going to take some of that. Okay, the thing you have to understand about fire is it needs, it needs three elements. It needs oxygen, it needs heat, and it needs fuel. And if you understand the needs of that chemical reaction and the physics involved, then you can manipulate those three elements to make your fire succeed. 
For instance, I can take this log and I can put a flame on it for a long time. But it's going to take a long time for this material to heat up to the point that you can get the log on fire. Because um, the size is too big to heat all this material up quickly. So you're going to need a big flame for a longer period of time to get something this big going. The oxygen can't get to the material quickly and it takes too long to heat it up and so you can't start when you're making a fire with a big piece of material unless it's highly flammable and so you have to um, break that down into smaller pieces that can heat up quicker and that the oxygen can get to quickly. Contrast that with this. This is a little bit of that cattail fluff that we gathered and it's dry now. Um, it's very light, it's very airy, the material is not that much mass so it will heat up very quickly and oxygen can get to it very fast. This will light very quickly with just a spark thrown onto it by contrast. Not enough oxygen getting to it, it's still a little bit damp, but you can see how it flared up right away and burned off what the oxygen could get to. So that would be a flash tinder and you'd need to mix that with other materials because it goes so fast. But I just want to contrast the difference between I could put a big flame on the larger piece of material and it didn't catch fire uh, and we would have to take more time to heat that up and we need a bigger flame to do it. Um, versus a, a tinder. And so when we're looking at making fire, we have to start with small materials that are have a lot of surface area that are very dry. Um, and we call those materials tinders. And then the next level would be kindling. So very, very small sticks, matchstick thickness and smaller up to just a little bit under pencil size and then kind of the next stage would be pencil size sticks and then the next stage would be more sustainable fuels so thumb size sticks or or bigger so you have to go up through essentially all the gears to build the flame up build the heat up um, uh, and then you also want to mix all those materials in a way that allows a lot of oxygen to get to all the materials. So let's talk a little bit about these tinders. So we talked about that cattail fluff. So here's a cattail seed head. Um, again, you can, if I light this as it is, it'll go, but it won't go as well as if I break that apart and I mix uh, that with oxygen by fluffing it up. So in general when you have a small flame or a spark and you're trying to get something going you want to really put a lot of oxygen into the mix and so you oftentimes have to prepare these tinders down. But what you're looking for is plant material that's very dry, fibrous, stringy, that you can spread out with lots of airspace. This is grass. We talked a little bit about gathering last year's dry grass but again this tinder uh, soaks up water very quickly so you, it has to really be bone dry to use as a tinder but a trick with that um, is to as you're going along to make your fire is to go ahead and gather up that grass bunch it up stick it in your pocket keep hiking dry it out in your pocket um, so that when you're ready to make your fire you have some nice dry tinder so this is grass this is doesn't burn as fast as the cattail fluff, um, but it will burn pretty fast when it's dry because it has a lot of surface area, a lot of oxygen can get to it. Then you have um, barks. This is some of that poplar bark, and um, we would want to break that down uh, a little bit more than this. You can see it's fibrous. Um, but we would want to buff that up and separate the fibers as much as we can. This is cedar bark. Again, you can see this is the inner bark of cedar bark. This material can be stripped out, separated into 
small strands of fibers that have a lot of surface area as well also makes a, a good tinder and these these tinders will be slower burning than the grass and definitely slower burning than the cattail um, another source of tinder is lichen I mentioned that um, this like the grass is very hydrophilic so this is a great tinder when it's bone dry but if it's wet at all it doesn't work as tinder so you'll have to dry that out uh, stick it in your pocket dry it out uh, trick is a good one for um, lichen if it's uh, wet or moist at all so if it's dewy in the morning um, this stuff will pick up water so will the grass you'll have to dry it out before you can use it as a, a tinder but it'll work great when dry um, in the northern forest um, we mentioned the birch bark um, you can scrape this which will show you can uh, if you have a flame you can shred this into little strips and because of the, the high resin content in birch bark in particular uh, this is a great tinder to use when it's wet this will take a spark directly um, as will all of these tinders if you prepare them right they'll take a spark or a flame um, and then we talked a little bit about looking for pitch as an accelerant this is the pitch that I took out of that a tree that had a, a wound on the side so um, we talked about the uh, sapwood or the fatwood and then here's just some pitch and this is an accelerant this won't take a spark but if you can get a flame on this this will get going and it will it will burn even um, relatively wet once you get a flame on it so these are just the first stages or tricks uh, that you could use to Get your fire going um, potentially under adverse conditions and it's the first stage of fuel so the first stage is tinder and then the second stage is kindling and then bigger kindling and then actually sustainable fuel and those are kind of the fuel grades and you have to work from smallest most easily flammable materials especially under adverse conditions to bigger and bigger materials you just can't start with a big log and expect it to um, uh, catch flame all right I'm just breaking down some of those uh, barks that we collected that's the poplar bark and I'm just trying to break that down into more fibrous material and now I'm scraping the inner bark of the cedar bark with my knife just trying to break those uh, fibers out into smaller and smaller fibers with greater surface area that will um, be able to start a fire Okay, so here we have all our natural tinders all prepared now. Okay, we have a little char tin going here where we're charring some material to make a different type of tinder called char cloth. And this is charred material. So basically we have a char tin that is just an old shoe polish container with a little hole on the top um, that doesn't let much oxygen get in but lets the gases escape. You put cotton, 100% pure cotton material in here or in this case I also have a, uh, a cattail head that I stuffed in here and we charred this material so it it is burnt but not entirely burnt up and so this char material will take a spark from a ferro rod or it will take a spark from a flint and steel and uh, light an ember off. And then you can take that ember and take it over to a tinder bundle made out of some of the tinders that we discussed. And so I made a mixed tinder bundle here with dried grass, cedar bark, and some of that cattail fluff. And what we're going to do is we're going to throw a spark into this char material, put the char cloth in the center of our tinder bundle, and then uh, when you're trying to light fire with, a, with an ember, such as uh, like this, or you're trying to light fire with an ember created with uh, friction fire, so bojo fire, 
um, then you have to blow that ember into flame and you would use a tinder bundle to do that. If you didn't already start out with flame or a tinder that would take uh, flame uh, from a spark quickly like birch bark. All right, Eric is going to show us how to use that char cloth and the tinder bundle we made. He's using his Mora companion knife that we modified to have a 90 degree spine on the back and he's going to scrape a ferrocerium rod um, to get some of that pyrophoric metal into the char cloth. And there we go, he's got a spark and he's landed that in the char cloth. And now we have an ember. You can see there's still some sparking going on there from the ferrocerium material. It's going to transfer that ember into our tinder bundle. These embers can be a little fragile, so you have to fold them into the tinder bundle, but uh, gently so you don't disrupt them. You can see that the tinder is glowing. Um, when you're dealing with embers, they're not hot enough to get the material going. You have to feed the combustible tinder material in towards the ember and then add oxygen to get the cellulose in that material up to flame. There we go. He's starting to get some transfer of heat from the ember into the tinder bundle. Um, so you want to just fold that gently around your ember and keep blowing, keep blowing until you can get the temperature up hot enough to reach the ignition point in the tinder. So if you're just folding that material around and then increasing the oxygen on it by blowing on it, and now he's got it. And so you would take this flaming tinder bundle and stick that into your prepared fire lay of kindling to get that going. But that's how you do it. Um, when you're trying to make fire from an ember, be that an ember from char cloth or an ember from a, a bow drill set, uh, it's all the same principle really. The preparation of the tinder uh, is key to making that work you have to have really dry uh, and good materials. Hi, it's Kai again. Um, I'm going to demo how you can make your own tinder in case natural tinders don't work. So um, some weather conditions like rain or snow can make it difficult to find dry, usable natural tinder, such as bark or grass. But um, a solution to that is you can carry your own man-made tinder. Um, so here we took a cosmetic uh, makeup remover pad and uh, dipped it in this lamp oil paraffin um, and soaked it and then uh, wrung out the excess and then melted some household paraffin wax and um, in a, just an old pot over the camp stove and uh, dipped it, dipped the cotton swabs into the wax and waited for them to dry. To use your tinder, all you have to do is tear it open to the fluffy part um, and then use whatever ignition source you want, like a spark from a ferro rod or a match or a lighter. And it'll burn in for a really long time because of the wax and oil in it. The advantage of this system is even if you get your tinder wet, you can just shake it off. And even if you get your ferrule rod wet, you can just dry it off. And tear open a section to the dry. And it'll still go. Okay guys, we're back at the house. We have 
all the materials we gathered out in the woods when we were showing you tramping around the woods and now we're going to break them down into various sizes and uh, get all ready to lay our fire. Okay, you can see by this time in the video that I've gone in the house to have an extra cup of coffee to speed things up. Um, but what we're doing is sorting out all the sticks that we harvested um, so we can lay them on the fire lay at different times as the flames build. So you need to sort all your materials into size. Okay, I wanted to talk to you guys about um, how to uh, prepare that tinder that we found, the birch bark that we found on the hike. Um, so um, I'm just going to show you how to prepare that for being able to take a spark from a ferro rod. If we were going to um, process it for using a flame or a match, we wouldn't need to process it quite in this way, and I'll show you that in a minute, but I'm going to show you how to prepare it to take a spark. So. Um, Basically, you take your knife blade, and on the silver side of the bark, you're going to scrape the blade uh, on the silver side of the bark and build up a bunch of little uh, curls on that. And I'm just going to scrape this up and show you. There we go. So turn it the other way. So I'm going to turn it the other way and scrape again towards me, making a little pile of these curls right in the middle of this piece. take the spark. Okay, that should be enough, I believe, to take a spark. I'm also going to take some of the, some more birch bark and just tear that up into little strips and we'll use this as our tinder and then we'll be set. Okay, so I'm going to put that to the side. Whenever you're building a fire, you always want to uh, prepare the ground and get all flammable material out of the way so that you don't have an uncontrolled fire. If you're in the San Juans at camp, normally we like to build below the tide line um, uh, on the beach, but here I'm just going to scrape off all the pine needles and flammable things down to mineral soil. Just want to clear away anything that could get burning that you don't want to get burning. And then your next step is to lay down a platform. So you want to use those dried sticks that we harvested, the dead standing wood. Uh, this does several things. Um, today the ground is pretty dry and so this uh, is not particularly damp down here, but if the ground were damp, if there's still a little moisture here. If the ground were damp, uh, we would want to insulate the fire away from the damp ground when it's just getting going. Any moisture will slow the combustion of that. Um, the sticks also create air channels that will bring air in under the fire. So as the fire starts to light, there's plenty of oxygen that will come up through the uh, kindling and get it going. And then the platform itself serves as uh, additional wood uh, and we'll get a bunch of hot embers going in the bottom of your fire. So uh, we lay down a platform. Then I'm going to take 
all those little twiggies that we sorted out and I put them into two bundles and lay them in an X on my platform. And then I'm gonna take my tinder scrapings and lay that, the little shreds I made, and I have a few more shreds off to the side here. Lay that in under the fire and then we'll come around and show you how we're gonna light that and watch it go. Okay, so we're just gonna get a nice little bundle of shavings to take a, a spark here. There we go. So you can see that that birch bark really takes off. So once the flames are coming through the, the canopy of the kindling solidly, that's when you would start to put more of the next stage wood on the fire. But you wanna make sure that the flames are coming through the pile of fuel that you already have on it um, solidly before you put more fuel on. Okay, one of the techniques that you could do to get small enough material to burn is basically creating um, kindling out of a larger piece. So if you couldn't find small kindling in an area, you go to a campsite and there isn't any um, small fuel around, it's all been used up or all of that fuel is wet, you can um, cut wood and then split out the center of the wood to the dry wood and then make that into smaller pieces. So we're gonna show you how to use that batoning technique and then we'll um, create some feather sticks um, and show you that method of um, creating burnable material when you're starting your fire. So we're just gonna baton this. So I'm using that batoning method that we showed you in the knife skills section of um, bushcraft skills. Um, I'm just splitting these out into manageable pieces and then we're going to use the knife to shave that into what we call a feather stick which is basically a stick with shavings attached exposing the wood and making that material um, smaller with more surface area so that it will um, rapidly combust. All right, this, um, this fire we're gonna light with matches. There's a right way and a wrong way to use matches. Um, most people have never been taught to strike a, mat strike a match the correct way, so they usually strike this way, but matches can break sideways really easily. So you actually don't wanna strike them with force coming through the side of the match. You wanna strike linearly along the match, and so when you light a match, you should strike along the um, along the line of the shaft of the match. So you strike the match like that because it's much more stable. You're less likely to break it. You don't want to immediately take your match to whatever you're trying to light until the wood of the match is lit. So you want to strike the match and then cover the match from the wind because the wind can blow it out and wait till the flame has taken the shaft of the match and then you go to what you want to light. So you're going to strike it, then you're going to um, 
shelter it from wind, tilt it down so that the flame starts to build up the match, engaging the match shaft in flame, and then you're going to try and light what you want. So again, this is birch bark again that we have prepared. Uh, I didn't scrape it the way that I did the others, I, other uh, birch bark preparation, I just shredded it because this will take a flame very, very easily. So I just have a little pile of that shredded up birch bark. And um, again, because of the oils in the birch bark, uh, it's probably one of the best tinders to use in wet weather conditions. Um, other scrapings would be, or other tinders to use in wet conditions would be scrapings off the fat wood that we talked about um, uh, in wet conditions um, because all of these things have resins in them and oils in them that are volatile and will keep um, going even if they're wet. Um, here are the two feather sticks that you saw we made. So again, we've taken and split this wood down from a large uh, larger log. Uh, this is a great technique if you go to a place that does not have small twigs that you can get to. So let's say you roll up to a, you know, a, a car camp campground and all the easy wood has been taken. Perhaps you have firewood. Um, you can split that down with a small hand axe or you can use the batoning technique that I showed you to split that into smaller um, pieces of wood and then you can shave it down to essentially kindling. So these are just shavings of that and um, shavings work fine too, but the advantage of leaving the shavings on the stick is that you can then manipulate um, that a little bit and all the shavings are attached. So the feather sticks, um, they, they, these are not the best feather sticks and I am certainly not the best feather stick maker yet. Um, it's definitely something you need to practice. Um, when you're um, trying to first learn how to make feather sticks, you want to select wood that has very straight grain, uh, wood that's relatively soft. And uh, as I was doing this, I was fi finding it to be a little bit easier to go across the, the grain um, as a lot of these were splitting versus um, uh, um, shaving. So um, just a couple of quick tips there. Um, and then you can carve one section, move your knife a little bit, carve another section and get smaller shavings off um, as well. So, uh, but they definitely take practice. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that would be something if you were going to try and do this, uh, just recognize that it's going to take a while to do that. Uh, and then when you do the first, um, shavings you're trying to just plane off a little bit to even up any unevenness in the wood and you want to start um, at the top and go all the way to the bottom even if the shaving falls off don't worry about it. just carry it all the way through the bottom you're trying to create a smooth planar surface from which to shave off um, but they you just have to practice so okay so we have two feather sticks we have birch bark tinder we have our matches um, and uh, we'll show you how to light that up All right, so I have my match. It is a little bit windy out, so I'm definitely gonna um, wait for the wind to die down, and then I'm gonna strike this match and, and cover it from the wind until it's um, engaging the shaft of the match, and we'll get going. Okay, there we go. So, trying to protect that a little bit until it's really going, and then get in there and light off that birch bark and so it's going. Then I can maneuver my feather sticks a little bit, stack them up in that V shape like we did the other one. You can see when you shave the wood and you expose that, um, it really takes off fast. And that's what you're looking for, especially if it's cold or wet conditions. You wanna use all that energy to put all that energy into the fuel quickly and get it heated up. And you have to sort out the size of your fuel so that you can build the bigger and bigger fuel. And don't make the mistake of 
trying to put too much large fuel on too fast. So I want to wait till the flames are solidly coming through that, and they are, and I can just go right on to the next level. Now I'm stacking them up in alternating angles to maintain that, maintain the air within the flame. So you can see that, that the flames are going right on through that. I can put my next layer on. I don't have to blow. I don't have to add more oxygen to it because the fire is pulling that oxygen in of itself. And I've created the proper size progression of fuel. So it's just that easy. Really all fires for all successful fires are really understanding the fire triangle and um, working with various fuels and knowing how to manage that fire triangle and usually it's I say probably the most common mistakes are not using the right fuel putting on too big a fuel too fast and not allowing the heat or the oxygen to reach that fuel in sufficient amount to get the next stage of wood adequately going. I wanted to talk a little bit about ignition sources. So, you saw us use a ferro-cerium rod or a ferro rod um, to throw sparks into tinder. Um, ferro-cerium rod is great in that it can get wet and it offers the ability to make many thousands of um, fires with the striking of that. It'll last a very long time and so uh, you can get the ferrocerium rod wet and um, you can always make um, many many fires with it. You won't run out of the ability to make fire so ferrocerium rod or a ferro rod is a very good choice for carrying with you. Um, if you know how to make tinder or you carry some emergency tinder with you a ferrocerium rod is a great combination and uh, the way that I use a ferrocerium rod is I have made the back of my knife sharp. So I've filed the back of the knife so there's a 90 degree spine on that so you can scrape the ferrocerium rod with the back of the knife and throw sparks from that. So that's a great option um, in that it'll give you many many fires and not fail if things get wet so I like carrying a ferro rod you don't have to have it uh, on your knife but you should have something in, with which to scrape it sometimes you can buy them that have a ferro rods that have a scraper with them and those are great too uh, light my fire is a um, little little fire steely that you can carry in your backpack that's a great little one um, Matches are also great. You always want to carry your matches in a match safe. Um, this is a military one and I don't didn't like it because it blends in and so I would rather have a, a match safe that uh, I can see so I put red on it um, just so I can see it. But you always want to carry a match safe so you can have these uh, matches remain dry because um, matches are vulnerable to getting wet. You can dip them in paraffin and that can prevent that to some degree and make them more flammable as well. I tend to like a mixture of Strike Anywhere and uh, then they also have these storm matches which are basically uh, matches that have a really big amount of phosphorus on them so they really make a large flame but they're not Strike Anywhere so I I like a mix of those. And then the last type of ignition source that I like carrying with me is a, a Bic lighter. And I like to put some 
duct tape around it because duct tape is a burnable emergency tinder as well. So in a pinch, um, you can also, um, you know, light that as tinder. And so this is a great um, lighter ignition source to have on you, but they can fail as well. So they run out of fuel. They don't work very well and when it gets very cold or, um, yeah, mostly cold. So if, it, if it's real cold, you're going to want to keep that inside your jacket and keep the uh, fuel source in the lighter warm. Um, if you have a good tinder like we, we talked about, some of that homemade tinder, um, even if the fuel in the uh, lighter runs out, the, the striker in here is a ferrocerium striker as well. And so even if the fuel uh, butane in, in the lighter ran out, you could still get a fire going from the spark of the lighter if you had a, a, a um, tinder source that would take that, especially like a char cloth would, would be able to um, light with just a spark from uh, the lighter portion of that. And then I also think it's always good to carry some of that man-made tinder like Kaya showed you how to make uh, in your pack because um, again sometimes it can be very hard to get things going if it's really wet or really cold. Another option is uh, that we didn't show you is uh, jute twine. So this is jute that has been prepared the same way as this was. So it's dipped in uh, paraffin oil and then dipped in paraffin wax and then this can you can light this with a spark and then you can this will burn for a long time and you can use that essentially as a uh, a long match um, my knife is actually modified to carry um, carry some of that wrapped around it and it's just underneath a piece of uh, rubber bicycle uh, inner tube and then um, sealed up with electrician's tape so uh, I basically took a, a basic Mora companion put a 90 degree spine on it, attached a ferro rod to it, and there's YouTube videos on how to do this. And uh, the kids and I did this as a project one weekend and we just put um, jute, treated jute wrapped around that. So this is a uh, emergency tinder on the knife itself. So um, that's a nice little trick. So those are all the modern types of uh, ignition sources that I think it's useful to carry in your pack uh, and with you if you're trying to start a fire. We may do a bonus um, video using primitive fire showing you how to use flint and steel or bow drill depending on how much time uh, we have um, before uh, to get the uh, video produced. So anyhow, um, but that's that's more advanced fire making and not something that is a everyday uh, type of fire making. So, all right, enjoy. Wanted to thank you for tuning in to our video on basic fire making. Wanted to just take a few minutes to summarize uh, what we presented in this video and talk a little bit about fire safety and um, some of the wilderness ethics of um, how do you leave no trace? So in bushcraft, uh, there's a lot of discussion around the paradox of fire, and that is simply this, that when it's cold and wet and you need a fire the most, it's oftentimes the most difficult to make fire. And so we have talked a lot about manipulating the three arms of the fire triangle, oxygen, heat, and fuel, in such a way to try and mitigate the challenges of building fires in cold and wet conditions. Um, we talked a lot about selecting the proper materials, going from tinder to the smallest levels of kindling to larger levels of kindling, and then building your flame up gradually um, to take it from a small spark or flame to transferring the heat to bigger and bigger combustible materials until you have a sustainable fire. We talked a lot about how do you 
create a fire lay that will give you your best advantage to insulate those early flames from cold, damp ground and channel air into your fire and how do you um, structure your fire to maintain maximum oxygen flow into the flames or into the fire and uh, move up gradually through your grades of fuel so that you can transfer heat uh, appropriately and not try and make too big a jump to a piece of fuel that's too large to heat up and catch fly, flame. So I hope uh, you learned a lot in terms of material selection and how do you find these things in the woods as well as actually building and making your fires. I want to talk a little bit about the flip side of the paradox of fire and that is sometimes when it's hot and dry or windy, that is a time where it's too easy to make fire. In fact, it's dangerous to make an outside fire because um, there's so much dry fuel in the forest uh, or the countryside that a uncontrolled fire could get going. And so we've certainly seen as climate is changing how the West is drying out more and more in the summers and oftentimes we have very prolonged burn bans and so oftentimes county or regional um, uh, agencies will decide that the conditions are just too dangerous to make fires outside and so you definitely want to respect that but in, in addition to whatever the authorities are saying you always want to use your own judgment about whether or not it is safe to have a fire outdoors um, sometimes conditions are just too dry and too windy um, and you can't control sparks uh, well enough to have a fire outside. You might still be able to have a fire say in the big house or have a fire in a, in a, a stove or, or something like that inside where there's screens and things like that to catch the, the sparks from blowing out into the countryside but you definitely want to always be aware of the flip side of the fire triangle and uh, always be safe when you are building your fires. The last thing I want to talk about is the ethics of leave no trace. Certainly at, at camp um, we strive to when we're camping and we're doing out camp trips or, or camping on some of our neighbors property that they gracious, graciously allowed us to use, uh, we always want to leave the area better than we find it. And one thing that can be very unsightly is if you leave fire scars in the area. And so some techniques that you want to use when you're um, making fires in the wilderness to attempt to leave no trace are to never burn really big logs that are not going to completely burn um, before you're done. So it's very rare that you should be putting logs on your fire uh, that are bigger than say your forearm. Um, what we don't want to do is put a really big log on a fire and leave it half burnt um, because then everybody can see that there was a fire there and it's unpleasant to have half charred wood um, just lying around and so you always want to uh, put the size of wood on that you're going to use um, for as long as you're going to use your fire. We also, if we're building fires, um, we want to select a site that's uh, minimum impact when you're going to build your fire. So at camp in the San Juans, it's great to build a fire on the beach and especially if you can build it below the tide line. And then you want to again select your size of wood so that you burn everything completely to ash and that will help you both make sure that you're getting your fire completely out and by out I mean that you've poured water on it and you should always have water nearby to dump on your fire in case it um, flares up for any reason um, and certainly when you're leaving you want to make sure that you've drowned your fire uh, in water and completely put it out you want to pour water all through those ashes make sure there's no hot ashes no hot embers um, and you want to stir that up and then make sure that you can put your hand in the ashes and make sure that there's no residual heat in them. You never want to throw 
rocks or dirt over a fire because that can actually insulate the um, embers and get them going again um, if, uh, if they smolder, if there's uh, any organic material in that um, layer of dirt, uh, it can continue to smolder. And certainly uh, another fire safety thing is if you dig down, if you're in an area where you have to clear off to mineral soil and you dig down and you're finding roots, uh, that are you know any any of any size you don't want to build a fire there because fire can get going in a root and then pop out later and so we always want to be really conscious of being good neighbors and um, taking care of the land and leaving minimum impact behind us um, I think that's it so I hope you enjoyed our video and that you learned a lot and uh, I hope you're out there practicing your fires and getting better at it Try and practice in different conditions and you'll get better and better. And just remember if you try and light a fire and it's failing for some reason, stop, take a step back and think about that fire triangle and see, well, what, what piece is missing of those? Or what, what do you have to tweak to make it work? You know, do you need more oxygen? Do you need more heat? Um, is it too damp? Are your materials too damp? So all of those things can play a role um, in getting a successful fire, especially if it's under difficult conditions. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks. Bye.